Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Chris Duggan, and you're on The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, we have Chris on and uh, Brooks Crenshaw, a friend of mine from the veteran side. He also is a, a friend of Bill Mankins, who's been on. And uh, I think you know Cortland as well, right, Brooks? I do. We uh, we all served uh, about the same time in the same discipline. Uh, it's a very small world, and, and uh, we were all pretty, pretty tight um, during that time. What was your are. discipline? Tell everybody so they can know. Uh, we were intelligence uh, uh, types for Naval Special Warfare, uh, primarily doing human intelligence targeting for uh, West Coast-based SEAL teams. Um, mm -hmm. And you kind of get rotated around and, uh, you know, you're, you're talking with the same people on a regular basis. You know? Yeah, it's I was very, sitting with two SEALs community. yesterday, maybe guys you know, maybe not. We can get into that later on. But that technically makes this a spy versus spy episode because I love having my peers <laughs> on the show. But ultimately, we're going to have Chris talk to us about business because – uh, one of the things that John and I decided to study more is just more about business. And when I think about that, I think about Chris and his like when people say they're a serial entrepreneur, they absolutely are because they get to define what they are. But Chris actually does this. He actually starts companies, gets them going and goes, I'm going to hire a CEO or we're going to sell this thing. So he has done the process a number of times with great success. And so thanks Chris, for coming on. Uh, well, thanks, Pete. But I actually think it's the same thing. If this is like combat, hand to hand, you know, warfare, yeah. doing direct, direct sales, enterprise sales, you know, we're just doing we're doing spy versus spy human intelligence activities that you know but we're doing doing it with software <laughs> yeah what but really as a spy that goes into the field um let me know when i say something that you don't have to do i have to establish rapport i have to work from a place of respect i have to build trust i have a pitch i have an ask i have all these things that i've got to account for it's absolutely a sales job exactly you have a target yep <laughs> yeah i need yeah. placement and access which a salesperson has to have placement and access, you know, I, I go find an agent that has placement and access, but I have to imagine you do the same thing. You're like, I'm not going to go in cold. I will, but I'd rather find someone I know or whatever. Right. Well, and just, I guess, just a very quick blurb of, I guess, what my sales credentials are. Um, I've been doing B2B software for 19 years. Uh, I've interviewed over a thousand salespeople. And I've probably fired about 60 salespeople, 70 salespeople. Uh, and I've hired five or six sales leaders. And I've probably interviewed about 75 or 100 sales leaders. Wow. So um, I've, and I've kind of seen, you know, see, done the scaling thing, done it when you don't have any customers and you're just trying to get something off the ground. Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions that you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out done it when you don't have any customers and you're just trying to get something off the ground uh you know kind of all factors of of like the b2b life cycle with regard to, to the sales piece pete you're you're you were right on the the nose with regard to placement and access actually one of the things i've been working on the last couple of years was developing targeting systems via software for lead generation so it, it's pretty incredible how that previous career translated to uh uh both B2B and actually in this case, B2 uh, government. We were going to talk about five sales mistakes that founders make, and I, we're kind of already in the topic. But Chris, I wanted to dive into what you were saying. Like the first one is, is delegating sales too early. Um, and, and I know like as a, as a founder myself of Lions Rock Productions, you know, I edit, I market, I sell, I do all of it. And I'm now to the point where I can put some of the editing off on, on a, a editor who joined the show recently, Damien. I, I don't know that anybody else but me can sell this right now. It's, it really has to be me. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, and there's been a lot of talk, obviously, over the years of, you know, product market fit and how do you establish that? And that's really what you're looking for as a founder. And what I've seen, I, I've probably met with a couple hundred entrepreneurs here over the last few years, coaching them, working with them, helping them. And, you know, what I find is that uh, very often they're not in a sales background or engineering background or, or, or non-sales background. And, you know, they're just starting to get the company off the ground and their, their, their personal bias is to hire somebody from the outside that they can just delegate this whole thing to. They don't have to worry about it. They don't have to go out there and make the mistakes. They don't have to go out there and, and, you know, ask for the order. They don't have to have confrontational kind of conversations. They don't have to, you know, basically do all of that. And, and, you know, the downside of handing this stuff to, over too early and is really the most important thing that you're doing as a founder in the early days is listening for the language that the buyer is using to describe mm -hmm. your product. And as a founder, I think you should be tweaking your language literally like every week. You know, it, we, we are, you know, and you, you know, it's typically a lot of founders go in and they kind of pitch their stuff and, you know, uh, and then they, 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 you know, then they kind of, you know, say, what do you think about all of that? And the, and the buyer says, oh, well, you know, we'll be in touch. I think a really great question that, that the founder can ask is, how would you describe what you've seen today? You know, well, actually, it's like, I think it's like this and this. And using those words and kind of using that language, you're going to put that on your website. You're going to put that into your pitch. You're going to use that with other buyers. And when you put somebody in between you and the customer and, and turn off that, that real-time access to those insights, you're actually holding back your own learnings and growth as a company. And the, sa and the sales guy is not going to, you, know, you know, or sales lady is not going to, you know, come back with all of those insights. This is the language they use. This is the, yeah. the nuance of kind of, I said this, but then they kind of didn't, they didn't get that. But then when I said this, they, get, they got that. And so I, I, I think the whole important thing about discovering product market fit is about listening to the customer listening to the words they use and listening to how they react to what you're saying. And if you do, if you put somebody in between you and the customer, you're going to lose that, uh, all of that richness. You know, this is similar to what I do. So if I was to go and join a, or if a new unit rotates into my area, or if I join a new unit before I start giving my world-class advice and counsel and finding things out, I, I watch them plan and I watch their PowerPoint presentations and I see what they're not accounting for. Cause then I understand like, this is our, our highest priority. And I'm like, okay, so this region is where they need me to go. They're not accounting for the people in this case. And they're not looking at the thing they're, they're all, here's the thing that military folks do and appropriately so, they always focus on threat. But what they suck at is dialing threat back and allowing growth of other things in there. So that's primarily what I do. But if I come in and tell a commander, hey, your campaign plan's gonna change completely 80-20 away from threat and towards growth, I'm dead. I don't survive that sales meeting. I don't get a call back, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. No, I get that. Yeah, and and here's the thing. I guess here's the like here's the rub. If the founder's not good at sales, they want to get somebody else to do it. Then they lose the insights that they should have been getting all along. And it turns out that the founder, they should work on sales. They should get some sales books. They should practice. They should make mistakes. They should learn, and they should get better at it. And they are going to have to get better at it if they want to have a successful B two B software company. But it turns out that their contagious enthusiasm far compensates, like provides adequate compensation for the fact that they're not great at sales. And so I think that's the other thing here that even though it's uncomfortable, you don't want to do it. People, obviously I'd love, if I was an engineer, I'd love to sit back at the office and just code all day. Yeah. But the reality is you started a company, you got to get out there in the field. You got to, you know, shake some hands and kiss some babies and, you know, you got to learn as you go. And, guess what? You're going to, even though you're not that great at it, you're going to do, you're going to do okay. If you keep adapting and growing and, and developing. I'm going to step on Brooks here. I'm going to leave you room for a question in a second, but I have to add some context to what Chris is talking about. Uh, I did at least to do a lot of handyman work for Chris uh, at, at one of his companies. And I got to like be in your guys's space after hours. Cause that's the best time to make a lot of racket and dust and everything. And one of your employees who was clearly an engineer 
had a cape at his desk that he apparently would wear on a regular occasion and like figurines like crazy from all of the Star Wars universe, right? So that person is doing the perfect thing. They're sitting at their desk. They're in their own magical fantasy Star Wars world. And and you're out going, yeah, that's great. I need you to do that. Let me go sell. Because it is it is the thing that you're, you're right. You have to do it. You have to be in the space and understand who your people are. Because you can't rely on somebody. You can rely on somebody else to engineer, but but not the sales part. And the one thing I just, the last maybe point on that I would make on this this first area is the amount of effort that engineers, let's say a technical founder, puts into the architecture, the foundation of the software, the design decisions of the software, but the amount of effort they put into reading a sales book, you know, go and read Solution Selling, Creating uh, Buyers in Difficult Markets, Michael Bosworth, go read that book and then go and do some sales calls you know, like just put a little bit of energy into adapting that craft because I guess what I would just say is for the first two years, you have to do the sales. So that that kind of answers part of my, my uh, question for you, Chris, which was, you know, you say that people m- mistakenly delegate sales too early. When is the right, that right point uh, to, to do that? And then how, you know, the, what are you looking for in your sales professional? How many, et cetera. Great. Okay. That would take us to the second big mistake that people make is if you're going to hire salespeople and there is a point where you have to hire them, we should t- we'll talk about the thresholds for that. But when you're going to do that, don't just hire one salesperson. You have to hire two salespeople, hire in twos. And it's a common mistake. I can only afford one salesperson. Why would I hire? I can't even afford two. If you can't afford two, you can't afford one. It's kind of how I think about it. Mm. And in order to hire two, it means you probably have to have enough sales that you've generated with all the mistakes and all the hairballs on it and all the, you know, issues. You probably have had to generate, you know, what could support a reasonable quota for a couple salespeople. And obviously in the early days, it's different than how you have a fully ramped quota and all that kind of stuff. But we're probably talking like five, six hundred thousand dollars worth of software. If you haven't sold five or six hundred thousand dollars worth of software, and now you're expe- you know, expecting to hire two salespeople, and we'll talk about why the two in a second, two salespeople, if they can't even generate that, then you're not ready to hire salespeople. And the reason I focus on two is you just, I, I think you have a lot of risk in making the wrong decision about who to hire. And by the way, I, I still do this. I've interviewed so many people. I've, you know, learned, I've pattern matched. I've, if I've kind of, uh, gotten better at at interviewing, but and I've been doing it for 19 years. But it's mistakes happen. That's just the reality. And one of the truisms, unfortunately, in sales is even the worst salespeople can sell themselves. That's unfortunately a dynamic that I picked up along the way. Yeah. And so I don't know. They can't close a window, but they can sell themselves uh, <laughs> in the interview. Um, but and you give them the order, and they're going to drop the order. They can't close the order. But the reason that we hire in twos is that if you account for the fact that there's likelihood of making a hiring mistake by adding two people, you're going to increase the quality of the signal that you're getting from the market. And you're going to see, you know, is this person not performing because of the product market fit or because of sales effectiveness? And if I have two people, I'm going to have friendly competition. I'm going to have, I'm not, I'm going to have less excuses. So it's so easy when you have one salesperson to come back and say, Oh, the pricing's too high. We don't have these features. We don't have this, you know, thing. The competition, the blah blah blah. The mar- so they'll take to they'll take you to excuse town left and right. And it, you know, and the reality is, if you're a, if a professional sales manager, it's like, well, did you understand the pain? Did you quantify the value? Do you understand why it's a differentiated solution? You know, you're gonna know how to uh, right. neutralize those right. those excuses. So it's almost like having a control group uh, in, in a sense. Absolutely. So Absolutely. can you talk, talk a little more about what, you know, personality traits, you know, that you're looking for in that individual? I would actually say the easiest way to hire salespeople with the least amount of mistakes is to find a company that has the same kind of sales motion that you do hmm. and poach people from that company. And I'm not saying come from competitors. I'm saying if you sell a $100,000 product, 
you should take people from companies that sell hundred thousand dollar products. If you sell a five thousand dollar product, you should not be shopping at Salesforce for salespeople. You should be shopping at Zendesk for salespeople. And so, the most important thing is, you know, and obviously, I'm not. I'm talking about staying within staying within your lanes. Like so, B two B software. You're probably if you're a security company, you're probably going to look for security people or infrastructure people. If you're a business application software, you're probably going to look only for business applications. But then optimize for, do, are these like people that know how to sell five and 10K products, 50K products, 100K products, million K, you know, million dollar products. And the rest of the, if they've survived a Zendesk, a Salesforce, a Atlassian, if they've survived six quarters, seven quarters, they've, or like that company that created the institutionalized selling environment has already been able to get rid of the people that are just totally in, ineffective. And, you know, but trying to get a, a, a salesperson that knows how to sell million dollar deals to sell a 5k deal, never going to work. Trying to get a 5k salesperson to sell a million dollar deals, never going to work. So I think it's fine to people understand your price point, understand companies that have the sales, same sales motion as you, and then just go, you should be, if you're a founder trying to build a sales team, probably at around 10 o'clock at night, you should be spending about an hour connecting with salespeople on LinkedIn every night to build your sales pipeline. And even if you're not ready to hire yet, you should be meeting with those people, networking. By the way, any salesperson, if they get reached out by a founder of a company that has a legitimate outreach and a legitimate, web, legitimate website, will probably take the meeting because they love saying yes, they hate saying no, and they also like networking. And you could just say, hey, you know, you're at Zendesk, I'm at a kind of a similar thing. What do you think about this? What do you, you know, and you could start to build a relationship that might take six months to close that individual, but you're kind of starting early with your pipeline. So you should be spending about an hour a day just sourcing candidates, even when you don't need them. That's great. You know, we, we say the, uh, the word networking a lot and, and you really should break it down to it ro its roots, like working your net. You know, and really going out and just engaging with your, your the nodes of your network, the floats, all of the different areas, because a lot of what you want is already in your net. It's just you have to spend time main, maintenancing it. At least that's how I find it to work. Yeah, I agree. And you have to keep filling your filling your filling your net. Like yeah. you have to keep adding to it. And you know, if you are if your company sells five K products and you're a B two B software application and you're based in the city. If you haven't connected with 10 or 20 or 30 Zendesk sales reps, something's wrong. Yeah. Start there. That's where your work is. Yeah. No, that's, that's I love identifying, Chris, where the work is. Like, this is the problem is you don't have this level of sales. So what's the thing you solve before that to get to that point? Well, you start engaging with the, uh, that. that's money. So, all right. So let me do some self-serving with this third point, because as a podcast producer, producer of creative things, a lot of what I do is, is a la carte pricing. And you were talking about making, making pricing, not complicated. And unfortunately I feel like I'm bound to this because, you know, I, I, I have a, a do it for you model. I have a model where I build capacity within your company. You do it yourself, um, you know, and then everything in between, but I definitely feel the pain of, it's just entire, like someone says, what are your pricing? And I'm like, what do you want me to do? And it's, it's hard. So help me, help me solve this problem. Cause I'm clearly making this mistake. Okay. So I think a big mistake founders make is they totally overcomplicate pricing. I've seen like the, the I've seen them. I'll say like, Hey, can I walk me through pricing? And they've got these like tables with volume tiers and discounts. And if you do the blah, 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 and options and, and it's like you don't even have seven customers. Why do we have all this, <laughs> this kind of crazy? Why we why we have all this craziness? So, and, and part of this is you're always going to continue to refine pricing, and you know the way that you price your first ten customers is going to be probably pretty different than your first hundred customers compared to your next thousand customers. You know th these things kind of like mature as the company grows. In the early days really you should be discovering what the right price is and and the way you discover that is you basically ask people you 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 kind of you pitch them on your idea and you say you know hey brooks um they're like well how much does this how much does how much does this cost and brooks should say um you know i really don't I, we haven't figured it out yet 
we were thinking that it's worth about fifty thousand dollars. What do you, do you think it's worth? You know, do you think it's worth fifty thousand dollars? Right. And they're like, yeah, okay, I could see that. Or they're like, oh, it's a little bit high, but I bet we could work through it. Or they're like, no, that's a crazy price. That's never we're never going to pay that. Okay, well, that's really great feedback. Well, what would somebody like you pay? Not you. Yeah. What would somebody like you pay? <laughs> not, I'm not talking about you, Pete. <laughs> right. I'm talking about somebody like you. What should you pay? Oh, they should probably pay like 10K max. You know, so I guess my point is like, it's not about how many seats and how many, you know, how many units are you going to do and how many requests and how many, what's your volume and tiers and impressions. And, and it's just kind of like, can you do 10 K? Can you do 50 K? Can you do 250 K? You know, by the way, the, the, you know, obviously it's tied to the value that you're delivering. Yeah. But you know, don't overcomplicate it. And by the way, like, it sounds like in your case, you know, your specific case is, you probably have to build a relationship with folks to kind of, they do a starter pack and then they're going to grow to the bigger thing. And then they're going to go like, Hey, we want just all we can eat. Pete. That, that, that's like the third enterprise. We're going enterprise with Pete. Yeah. So don't try to sell somebody the enterprise Pete on the first interaction. They're not going to buy it anyway. And you're just going to, you know, overcomplicate things. One thing I found is my personal experience with this. I once had a deal with Hilton. I worked so hard to get this deal. I cold called it. I flew down many times. I pitched them. I did the big meeting. I got the thing. And then the, the general counsel called me and he said, Chris, we have great news. We have selected your company and we want to buy your product. Can you send me two options about how to move forward? And I was like, yes, we got the order. And I went back and worked on two options. And I sent it to them and they took so long to determine which option, it's so difficult to decide which option should we go with? Option A, option B, we don't want to make a, a mistake. You know, like, oh, this is really difficult. And they took so long, I lost the order. Uh. The, guy, the guy that got transferred or something. And so I believe that there are no options. I believe there's only one right option. And I believe that you should ask the questions that allow you to determine, you know, Pete should say, is this your first time investing in podcasting? Have you done other investments in this area? Uh, are you looking to just try something or do you want to go really big with this? Well, it's our first time. We just want to try something. So there's only one option. It's called the $7,500 package to get started with Pete. Yeah. That's no. what, and if you pitch anything other than that, you are wasting time and losing the, losing money. Oh, that's so brilliant, man. I, I love it. Cause you're right. You, you're, you're, ex and a lot of these things I figured out for him, you know, I really have to start with trust because I'm a guide in this process. They don't know how to do it. I frankly don't know how to do it for them. I know how to, I can make a podcast show up, but I can't make the right podcast show up for Brooks or for Chris. Like, so, so I have a whole system and, and there's impossible barriers. And a lot of them are fear that we have to get through. So I have to explain this to like, you want to do this in four weeks. I'm telling you, it takes three months. We can always go faster, but let's put it at three months just to get them to put six shows out is an enormous challenge. It doesn't seem like it because you dream and you get all crazy, but you're right. Like that, yeah, yeah. You solved a big problem from. You've illustrated a big answer to a big problem. We'll see if I can figure out how to deploy the answer because that's the other problem. What I would say is that if you are giving options, it is evidence of the fact that you don't understand your customers' needs. Yeah. No, that's, that's brilliant. That's like I should have said at Hilton. It's a, and here's a perfect example. And and every founder is going to say, "Oh, Chris, that doesn't work in practice," because they're going to say, "Well, what you know, maybe what's the price for 100 seats, and what's the price for 10,000 seats?" Well, the question is, how many seats do you need? Yeah. Do you need 100? Then I'll give you a proposal for 100. If you need 10,000, I'll do that. If if you're not going to deploy 10,000 today then it's not even a relevant conversation. Right. Let's start with 100 or, or you know, or could we go to 250? Could, can I work on a proposal for that? But the proposal that I give you is the proposal that we're going to stand by. I don't want to just throw darts at the dartboard and just manufacture scenarios here. Yeah. I want to understand what you're trying to accomplish, and then I'm going to give you the winning proposal. 
What about, I want to push this a little further. So in terms of, of complicating pricing and everything and creating that value, one of the problems I have is getting, getting my client to under, and I'm positive this is a problem for everybody, you know, defining ROI. Like, are they buying something that's a marketing tool? Because that's what I'm packaging. Or am I trying to sell mattresses for them? I'm not mattress salesman of the year. You know, if you want to use your podcast to sell product, that I'm not the guy for that. So, but it might be that they really, what they are, because they don't know the marketplace, maybe they really understand that this should be a marketing tool that creates value and sells mattresses later because of familiarity. What do you, what do you do about that in that case with your pricing as you try to approach this? I mean, I could, we could do a whole show on this topic. What you're really talking about is like the solution buyer versus the commodity buyer. Right. And where does value kind of stand on this kind of continuum and you know and what should you be willing to invest in while they kind of fully realize the value i mean there's like many many tactics that go into this discussion i would just say by the way create uh, solution selling creating buyers in difficult markets excellent book for understanding this concept um and highly recommend it to anybody that's trying to get ahead in sales um i the short answer is there's solution buyers and they're very easy to recognize there's commodity buyers, and they're mostly easy to recognize. But there's also commodity buyers that can be turned into solution buyers through a variety of tactics and techniques. I'll back out for a second. We're, right now, we've we've been kind of entrenched in in the the, the sales game within within you know the, the the company you would be involved in. But I want to back up to the the beginning when when you found a company, you know. <laughs> All we have is time and what it takes to get a startup. I'm a veteran of several startups. You've got to throw yourself at that. So what what is the thing that makes you decide you're going to throw a part of your life at something? Is it, you know, is it product market fit? Is it passion? Is it, you know, is it scratching a certain itch for you? Can you, can you talk to me conceptually about that? I mean, I think that's also like a whole topic too, but <laughs> I would say, it's incredibly difficult to do a startup as we all know. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm like the poster child for like the ups and downs of a startup. You know, I've had a heart attack from startups. Wow. I've had, you know, a variety of issues related to startups. Um, and, and some, I have had some, I would say reasonable success and, you know, and huge failures. And, I guess what motivates me is I just love the incredible challenge that comes with the startup and overcoming incredible odds. And I think that that takes like a ridiculous amount of energy. And I think that uh, that to me is the funnest part of a startup. Actually, when they get bigger and they're kind of like you're hiring professional managers, Personally, I don't really get that excited about that stage. Um, and I think there's people that do, and I think that, that I have a lot of respect for the people that can operationalize that stage of company. But I feel like I'm like the, the, like the early stage kind of like discovering things and like iterating and like try something and then it fails and then go back and try it again and keep trying. And to me, I just find that process really like intellectually stimulating and you know very difficult and i know that most people actually can't do it i maybe that's some satisfaction for me is that i just know that most people when they try, if they try to do that would find the odds too difficult just loving the grind yeah. the, just the grind section that process you're yeah. <laughs> okay well that, that's yeah that, that tells me a lot about you so so it, when you're we're back to the sales piece you know you mentioned not to delegate it first too soon once you've got a sales team involved how heavily are you leaning on them specifically for you know for your funnel well i think so that's a really great point um that, that actually takes us to the next section which i think is like big mistakes founders make is that they will hire salespeople, but have no marketing strategy yes and i don't understand that like you know it's uh, it's it, it is reasonable to expect some leads to be generated by sales. 
it is not reasonable to expect all leads to be generated by sales. It's a simple, like, do you want salespeople generating leads or do you want them closing deals? And so, you know, if you don't have a marketing strategy and, you know, that could be a whole topic of itself, but, you know, how you're creating the brand, how you're creating awareness and interest in your market, how you're engaging with your buyers, how you're getting them to the website, how you're getting them to start to understand that this solution exists, how you're getting them. You need some pull. Put, sales can't do 100% pushing. The market needs to pull. And by the way, if you do that marketing side really well, the pull is ridiculous. Like the pull is overwhelming. And so like you need the, you need the hand-to-hand combat, which I love doing, by the way. I love that in the field, just drop me in hand to hand. I do, you know, like, I love that. Yes. You're getting that from me. Are you getting that? Yes. <laughs> uh, knee, knee deep in hand grenade pins. That's what I'm I ready to go. Put, drop <laughs> me in. I'm ready to go. But you also need the air cover. Yeah. You need the jets flying overhead and, you know, kind of, you know, clearing the land so that your, your soldiers are successful. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Yeah. You need the jets flying overhead and, you know, kind of, you know, clearing the land so that your, your soldiers are successful. And you know, that's that marketing to me is that air cover. No, this is a great thing because it's um, if you go on a mission, especially a dismounted walking mission in Afghanistan, this is how dangerous it is. Once you're about 45 minutes out from the camp, um, you really there is no help coming. I mean, it, remote camps, right? Yes, there's um, a, an F something flying overhead, and maybe you have some helicopters tasked to come and fly through your zone for five minutes. And, and and that presence is significant. But without that, you're really on your own. You know, you're out there trying to do it. And it's uh, if you get into a firefight, the whole firefight is going to happen uh, before any help comes because the outpost you're at is so remote so far, by the time they uproot, get and they're doing as fast as they can, and they move 45 minutes into the future, whole firefight is over, and now the camp where they came from is barely manned, and now they're at risk. So this is a great sales anal- analogy. So you have to, on these foot patrols, very carefully manage how you plan your close air support. You know you know that there's a fast mover ahead, and if things get dicey, they may be on station, but what if there are two fights? You know, and you don't control the other fight. It's not even in your region. Or um, what if the helicopter, and this happens all the time, what if the helicopter breaks? Your marketing person has a baby, you know, and they're gone for three months. And so I encounter this a lot with, with companies where they want to do, I'm doing quotey fingers, marketing. But Chris, there's no strategy and there's no budget. And so they just do marketing by firefight. They're just like, uh solve this problem solve that problem oh shit we're gonna go to a conference you know and it's just a it's 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 firefighting instead of air cover and i'm gonna shut up now but i think it's a great analogy i mean i think you've painted it perfectly i guess i would just say that this is further evidence of the fact that the founder has had to do some pretty good amount of sales in order to justify two salespeople and a marketing budget and marketing, you know, you know, kind of programs, because it, it's just can't, you can't just kind of throw a throw a salesperson out there in the field and just hope that magic's going to happen. It, they need, you know, they need all this to support. And, you know, and, and so I, I guess that's kind of the key thing is, you know, I think coming up with what's the ratio of leads that we expect our salespeople to generate and our marketing, our marketing team to generate. I think there's got to be mutual accountability around that. And I think it's not, it's reasonable to have salespeople generate some leads, but it probably should be something like, you know, even just to start, maybe 50, 50, Mm -hmm. you know, salespeople are creating 50% of the leads, marketing's creating 50% of the leads because it's just going to make it easier for everybody to kind of scale things if that's happening. You know, I was, I was lost in Fob Tangy uh, based on your uh, last analogy. I was, (laughs) <laughs> gone back in my mind in a uh, story when you yeah yeah you, you took me back to the day um, apologies no but but that but that's critical because 
I'm describing something that's real for you. I put you in a different, I, we went time traveling to that fob for you. Yeah. And, and Chris, I'm positive has examples of that where like, you know, so, so here's how I understand how marketing works is you're trying to create a number of things. Yes. Marketing materials and flyers and bullshit like that. And we can all hand that shit out all day long and it doesn't really close the deal. I need someone who can close a deal. How close can my marketing people get my salesperson? So what they're doing is taking down deals, big, fat, juicy deals that keep us alive. And so marketing material great i also need familiarity so when i show up they're not like who 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 are you what do you do who are you? like marketing helps that like i want that salesperson just you know working on rocket fuel that my marketing team builds for him and and that's exactly what you want an infantry squad i have, to a, do. I have a good story on that so okay, i'm shutting up it's your show so one one thing that um that i like to study is uh procurement tactics Ooh. And so if you're a salesperson, you should know procurement tactics because that's, you have to neutralize them. That's part of being a professional salesperson. And there's many tactics and we could do a whole show on, on tactics, procurement tactics, but the one that always sticks out to me, and I was just talking about this yesterday with a friend is uh, procurement people like to negotiate in reverse preferential order. And so what that means is, if you, you go and do a Google search, you find like three providers and um, you figure out who's the best. You have to know who's the best, who's first, second, and third based on like quality product, company size, just like who we want to partner with and, and kind of quality of the, of the of the solution. And you figure that out first, second, and third. And then you, you don't go to the first and ask for the price. You go to the third and you ask for their price. And you say, we realize that you're actually the smallest, the weakest, the slowest, the least resourced but we know that your price is going to be really good. And you know, what, what's your price? And they say, okay, well, we'll do it for 50 bucks. And then you go to the second one and they're usually there a hundred, but you say, Hey, the third, the, we're talking to these guys, they're going to do it for 50. You know, can you do it for 60? We'll pay a slight premium, but not more than we'll do 60. Then you go to the first who you actually want to do business with their price is 150. And you say, Hey, the second guy just told me 60. I'll do you for 75. And now you basically got their product for 50% off. You were never going to buy second and third. You only talk to second and third to help you to negotiate the best price with the first. And so the salespeople had nothing to do with that conversation. That was like the perception of the company, how it shows up, how it presents itself, the solution, you know, and, and so I think that's something to keep in mind. That, that is that story. I, I'm coming from economic development. So I've been doing economic development for a couple of years now. And that strategy plays across the board with regard to site selection consultants. You know, they've got, you know, they've got three states that they're looking at to get this company to expand or relocate to. And they're keeping two of them around just to get the bidding up. Right. I mean, that's that's just the game. But yeah, that's that's exactly what happens there. It's fun to figure out how to neutralize procurement people, though. That's <laughs> So you, you you've now hired a couple of, of of salespeople for your for your fledgling sales team. You've got a marketing strategy. You are in the hiring mode. What is the worst hiring mistake, in your opinion, that you can make, or that you have made that you've learned from the most? I mean, I've made many many mistakes and many hiring mistakes. Um, I'll just share a very quick, quick story of one. And then we'll talk about the fifth, the fifth topic that we want to talk about. The, the quick story is that what I've learned along the way of interviewing over a thousand salespeople is that anything you pick up during the interview that you're like, kind of like, Ooh, that's kind of weird. Or, Ooh, that's a head scratcher. will only come back to be magnified a hundred times over after they start. Nobody ever said, oh, that's kind of an odd thing. And then said, oh, that, that totally went away. I never saw that again. Nobody's ever said that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's like the first date. You know, you, you're not liking her voice right off the bat. It's probably not going to get any better. I mean, I, you know, I don't know about that, all that. But I just know that <laughs> whatever you pick up during the interview is not going away. And... Um, and so that's just kind of an interesting thing. Um, and, but on the fifth topic, what I would say is 
um, the, a big mistake that, that founders can make is really around this VP of sales. And VP of sales is one of the hardest positions to hire for. It's an extremely risky position. Um, there's actually significantly more downside to your company than there is upside by making the wrong choice here and, and the risks involved. And, and we could even spend a whole topic just talking about all of the risks and all of the implications and issues, but just a couple kind of t highlights. I would say uh, one big mistake founders make is that they hire a salesperson and they call that person VP of sales, which just does not make any sense. Hmm. Um, they, if you're hiring a salesperson, call them a salesperson. Leadership by default. And so like that, they're not a VP of sales. A VP of sales, by the way, you shouldn't even have a VP of sales unless you have like seven or eight salespeople um, because it just, that just doesn't make sense. And so, you know, if you, if you're, if you're really, you know, hiring a VP of sales and they really are a salesperson, then you're hiring somebody that's significantly underqualified for the real position. Um, and it, I think it's just easier just to say, we're looking for a salesperson, an account executive, or, you know, uh, you know, or if you have to do something, you, you know, cause I think you can use titles as a little bit of currency in a startup. You, maybe you say like a director of sales, but there's no reason to do like a VP of sales. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, the other thing you can do is that, um, it, and obviously you can choose the wrong kind of salesperson and, and by the way, for, for a leadership role, but one thing to think about is go back to the earlier thing we talked about, which is like, you know, Hey, find the salespeople that can sell your sales, you know, sales price in, in a similar, you know, kind of B2B software app or infrastructure, whatever that might be find a leader that comes from that same kind of environment that they know how to build a team that knows how to do that. And I've seen, you know, oftentimes we hire, you know, VP, VPs of sales that are coming from a different industry that are coming from a different sales motion. And, you know, they're just not going to work out. It's not going to be a fit because of where the company is and kind of what the company needs. And they're not used to hiring the same, the right type of people. They might, if you have a couple of people, they probably won't do a great job of retaining those people. So um, hiring to junior or, or giving somebody the VP of sales title when it's not deserved or not sticking to this kind of like pattern matching when you're ready to start to build your sales leadership, which, by the way, like we said, is probably seven or eight people, you know, before you can even justify a VP of sales. Um, those are probably some of the, the, the kind of the issues. One other thing, and this is a little bit maybe controversial, but you probably are not going to keep your VP of sales around forever. Mm. And the reality is, here's the one, I guess the reality. The VP of sales that you hire today and who you could actually get today, if your company's growing, you could get somebody far superior in 18 months from now. Huh. And if your company's growing, if your company's not growing, then that's not the case. But then you already growing, have the wrong sales VP. You, yeah. Well, yeah, that is, that's right. But if the company's not growing, then, you know, then you're kind of, you're, you're stuck with these cards, but if your company's growing, you should be kind of reinventing your sales leadership, you know, as you grow, there are a few examples, a very few examples where the sales leader themselves reinvented themselves. And the person that they, you know, the 10 million ARR company sales leader became the 50 million ARR sales leader, became the 100 million ARR sales leader. I think I can count on them with one hand, the examples of those sales leaders. The vast majority of companies had to basically just put them on a treadmill and then move them along as they got to the next milestone. And so what that means is as a founder, the, I guess the nice thing is, while there's a lot of downside risk for you because you could mess up the sales motion, kill your pipeline, lose your sales team by hiring the wrong person. I guess the good side is that as soon as you do that, you're probably going to redo, redo the decision another 12 sure to 18 was. months from now. So when you're, when you're building this sales team and you know, the VP is a temporary position, you know, when I deal with culture, when I, when I get hired to consult on culture with CEOs, a lot of times they talk about the culture is of my company is like it's family, it's, it's business, it's whatever, right? But when I go out and talk to the folks on the floor who are doing the work, the dude with the cape and everything, 
I don't often find trust. So does the VP of sales know that like, this is probably going to be a short term you know, solution? Or, or, you know, are you, are you snatching the rug out from underneath them? And then, you know, poisoning the trust? Well, I mean, it, it's, it, I know there's a balance there, but talk about that balance. So I, I mean, I, there's a couple things on that. So number one is that any sales leader that has been around knows that how this is how it all works. Yeah. The average tenure for a sales leader, I think is something like less than 24 months. I think it's like 20 months right now. So this is a natural evolution of things. And I think the way to handle this in a trustworthy upfront kind of way is to say, you know, let's make sure that we're having checkpoints on a regular basis that, you know, that the company is going to have huge milestones and that you as a leader are growing in the ways that we need to continue to reinvent this role. And if I'm not seeing it, I'm going to let you know. And if you're not seeing it, you should let me know. But, you know, there is a scenario here where you don't grow with the company. Yeah. And we should be really open about that. Is that, I hear what you're saying. So let me push you a little more with this. That conversation, how frequently in your experience does that VP come to you and say, you know, like you have your sweet spot, you know, where you like to grow the company, the other parts are like, just not as exciting. So maybe that salesperson realizes that and they go, Hey, Chris, uh, it's been about 18 months. I think it's getting pretty close for me to go. Have you had that conversation with the salesperson where they initiate it? Yeah, but it won't come. It, it, it would be more usually the trigger because obviously sales is very measurable. We all know what the quote is and we know what the number is. The, the, the thing that happens before that conversation is that there's a huge miss. Mm. And then, you know, the huge miss happens and maybe it's two misses now, three misses. So this isn't just like out of left field, a big surprise. Oh my gosh, I think things were going well. Yeah. This is like, you know, hey, we are counting on numbers. Yeah. The business needs the numbers. You signed up for these numbers. We didn't just make up these numbers. You signed up for them. And we had a plan and I'm not saying like, I think you learned and things change and the marketing person went on vacation. So we, Hey, we kind of adjusted this. We adjusted that. We're being reasonable people. Yeah. But if you can't keep up with the growth of the company and excuses are, well, I couldn't hire fast enough. Not my problem. That's your problem. Right. Or, Oh, we had the really big deal pushed. You know, that's the sales leader's problem. You should have built more pipeline. Or, you know, our systems aren't keeping up with this. Well, you know, we should have been investing in systems as we're scaling. Whatever those excuses are, you know, they're going to take you to excuse town. And, you know, and you have to kind of make some determinations about, is this person ready to come back this quarter? Right. It's, a, it's almost like every quarter, it's like, are we going to re-sign, the, you know, we're going to re-sign, you know, uh, you know this player yeah. to come back and, and play, you know. Uh, you know, Steph Curry to come back for another quarter. Are we going to, are we going to, are we going to do that? And is Steph going to join with us? Are we going right. to, it's a mutual extension. And I think that um, if you don't have that discussion, honestly, then I think that like, things can become very complacent or it's, then it's like a backroom dealing with the board. You should get rid of this guy. Oh, it's going to be a total surprise. And to me, that's like an unhealthy way to kind of handle it. That's uh, uh, I want to take that and I want to combine um, the air cover part of the question that VP is sales that that uh, is the marketing person subordinate to the top salesperson. Do that. Does that marketing does that vi- salesperson then own that marketing piece because they they own the outcome. Yeah. So I've seen I've I've done both. I've seen both where sales and marketing are peers and that marketing is a. Uh, part of sales. And that's kind of what you see with like a chief revenue officer is they own sales and marketing. Right. Okay. And I don't believe today, by the way, I could change this tomorrow. Okay. Fair enough. Today, I believe that sales and marketing should be two separate uh, yet equal peers. Okay. And that they should work together, that you need healthy tension between the two and that they need to be pushing on each other in a collaborative manner and that their peers because I also think that sales is a whole discipline. Marketing is a whole discipline. If you try to roll it all up into one thing, you don't know who to blame. And that does, I'm sure there's still some bad behavior that comes if you have it separately. There's some, oh, there's some, 
this, it's this person's fault, it's that person's fault. But when you combine them, it's even harder to figure out who's to blame. Is it a sales or marketing issue? So we just kind of covered, you know, your take on the, the dimension of hitting the metric, right? Uh, where Pete and I come from, culture is everything, you know, uh, de defining that culture, building that culture, uh, being in, in the team culture. Say you have somebody who's hitting that number, but culturally is a, a cancer on the, on the team. How do, how do you weigh that dimension, you know, culturally speaking in, in your, you know, uh, in your tribe uh, versus the, the short-term numbers? You know, I think that this is probably a function of like manager tenure. Probably a younger manager would just say like, we can't do anything to disrupt, you know, change the number. We need the number. We need it. We need it. Yeah. <laughs> and then a more sophisticated manager is like, you know what? We don't need that. Mm. <laughs> and they're just like, let's move this person along. We don't need the distractions, disruptions, drama, noise, ener negative energy. And so they, the, the sophisticated manager probably has confidence that they can figure out the process to instrument to have other people achieve at the higher level. And the younger manager is like, oh, I can't do, I gotta get, have this person on the team. So that, I don't know, that's just my bias towards it. Discretion through, through experience. I think so. Yeah. And I think that that experience, especially on um, something you said earlier, it, you know, what I've learned, and I'm positive I can speak for Brooks on this, is I've learned more like what mistakes to eliminate than than like my brilliance like i just kept chipping away like you're an idiot you're dumb i can't believe you did that again <laughs> and again and again until finally i was left with this thing that i'm like yeah i know what i'm doing now but i had to fuck up a thousand to one to get to this Too point stupid to quit <laughs> oh, so I, I have a good final story on that I have a good quick a quick final story so i've been playing a lot of chess lately and i've been watching a lot of youtube videos on chess and I always thought, here's what I always thought, that great chess players were way smarter than me. That's what I always thought. And now that I've kind of started to study it a little bit more deeply, I've realized that great chess players are not smarter than me. They make less blunders than I do. Yeah. And I think that's a pretty inspirational thing to relate to the workplace. Yeah. Yeah. Racing, same thing. I need to put myself in a position where, you know, I make as few mistakes as possible and, and half of it, 70% of it, I'm going to rely on some other team to make a mistake. If I just drive clean and I don't burn fuel, I don't have to use, I don't burn rubber, I don't have to burn, and I just stay smooth and fast, I will take my chance with that, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> cool. Brooks, anything final before we let Chris go? But yeah, I, actually, um, I want to go back to the very beginning, actually. What, do you favor structurally when you're starting a, a company? Do you favor any particular structure? Like what? As from, the, from, from the legal standpoint, I mean, is there, is there any formula or, or method that you, that you, is it case by case? How, how, do you, how do you, as a founder, how do you determine how you're going to structure? So like you mean like a C Corp kind of thing? Like Correct. I, I would, I always try to make things as vanilla as possible. I like and it. Van, vanilla is Delaware C Corp. Nice. There might be specific re reasons for other things that might be more tailored to your industry. But if you're trying to be, create a venture backed company, uh, you don't want to have any reasons to, for people to pass. And one reason people wouldn't pass is because it's just a vanilla Delaware C Corp. I love it. Nice. Great. Hey, Chris, we've had you for an hour. Uh, I know we can instantly do another hour, but let's uh, schedule something down the road. And just, man, thanks for coming on and sharing this stuff, because if nothing else, you've helped me. Help me prune off a couple of branches on my stupid tree. No, I like it. I like I like this, the whole discussion about warfare and sales and bringing those two things together. I think they're totally, you know, together and, and uh, make a lot of sense. So uh, I, I appreciate the conversation. Yeah.